Hello, everybody. In September of 1988, my mother sat in her first parent-teacher conference of the school year. After only one week in second grade, I hadn't uttered a single word, and not only that, every time my teacher looked at me, she thought I was going to burst into tears. And she was right. I was absolutely terrified in second grade because I thought my teacher would call on me when I didn't know the answer and that I'd be embarrassed in front of my classmates. And while this isn't an actual photo of me, I think the girl's eyes capture how I was feeling. And I think sometimes our own students feel this way too. Sometimes even the most outgoing kid wonders, is what I'm saying, thinking, or doing right? Is that what my teacher wants? And if the kids are spending all this time trying to figure out what we want, are they really learning? From the time we're very small, our learning community consists of our family and friends, and we learn together by interacting with each other. Here, it's difficult to tell who's doing the teaching and who's doing the learning. My youngest daughter, Amelia, is learning how to play with a new toy, but she's also teaching her two sisters how to be patient with somebody else and how to accept another member into their playgroup. As we start to move into school, some structures are put into place, but kids still spend a good amount of time learning from each other on the playground, reading together, working together at a center. But then as we start to go up the grade levels, our classrooms and our learning communities start to look a little bit more like this. And the focus turns to the person standing at the front of the room. Does this sound familiar? If I want to do well in this class, I'd better listen to my teacher. How can I improve my narrative story? I should look at my teacher's comments and feedback. The message seems to be, if you want to do well in school, you'd better look to your teacher. And yes, teachers are an extremely important part of the learning community, but so are the other 18 people in the room. Now, I'm not saying that standing up in front of the board and explicitly teaching something is wrong. That we absolutely have to do every day as teachers. But there is a way to have more balance between teacher talk and student voice. So in an effort to add some more student voice in my classroom, I tried this in math. We were learning about multiplication, and I put this problem up on the board. And I said, OK, please solve the problem, and then I want you to share your strategy for how you did it. And I thought, perfect, they'll be talking to each other, they'll be sharing ideas, this is exactly what I wanted. Good, student voice, check. So Ling put up her hand and said, oh, I want to tell you, this is how I solved the problem. And he said, okay, thank you. And then Yuki came up and he showed how he solved the problem. And then I said, thanks so much guys, let me show you another way to do it. And I showed them the standard algorithm for multiplication. And then I said, all right, look at this. We've got three different ways to multiply. Great. But what I was really implying is that my method was the way I expected them to do it. So then why did I bother to ask their ideas in the first place? I ended up doing the total opposite of what I had set out to do. I wanted them involved in the lesson. I wanted them learning from each other. I wanted us to learn better together, but I didn't do it effectively. But I did think about this lesson for a while, and I said, I'm going to try this again, but let me try a different subject area. So in writing, we were writing informational picture books for a second grade audience, and the students had to go and meet with the second graders and find out what kinds of books they'd be interested in reading. Then after they drafted, they went back to the second graders to ask for feedback on how their books were going. And here's what one student had to say about it. My topic is beautiful birthstones, and second grade feedback is very helpful to me because I can add more details like where aquamarines come from, and they want to know where aqua where they can find aquamarine. So I want to research more and find the answer and add in here. So this was Bella's first draft of her section on aquamarine. And if I had told her you should add more details in this section, she probably would have done it because she's a really great kid. But when that feedback came from another student, she had the drive and motivation to find that information on her own and make her content clearer for her reader. 
So what are some of the benefits of learning better together? Well, confidence. When we share our ideas, thinkings, and wonderings with other people, our confidence builds because we realize we're not the only ones wondering about a certain topic. Motivation. When we come together for a shared purpose, we connect with each other and we're motivated to do our best because we know we have an authentic audience who cares about what we're doing. Perspective. When we listen to other people's ideas and opinions, it opens our eyes to seeing a different point of view and getting to know the topic and the person a little bit better. Community. When we come together for a shared purpose, we want each other to succeed and we respect each other and help each other to reach our common goal. And this isn't just for kids. Adults can learn better together too. When I was living in Saudi Arabia, I was teaching fourth grade again, and I was doing an online course, and one of the projects was I had to collaborate virtually with another teacher in another country. And as soon as I read those requirements, that scared little second grader popped right back up. And my head was filled with questions like, what if nobody wants to work with me? What if my partner doesn't like my idea? What if she doesn't like something I say or do? But this time, I decided to force all those thoughts away, and I put myself out onto Twitter for the first time. And I connected with another teacher in neighboring Bahrain. We realized that we both taught similar social studies units, so we developed a collaborative unit where our students had to compare and contrast our two host countries of Saudi and Bahrain. And I learned so much from this experience. I learned how to use new tech tools in some innovative ways, I got to see another teacher's thought process when developing a unit. And I got to make a new friend and a colleague, even though we had never met face to face. So how can we do this more with our own kids? Well, I think it involves intentionally inserting student voice into our time with our students. We need to let them know that their ideas, questions, and thinking matter. It could be as simple as explaining a math strategy to a partner. It could be as complex as giving shared feedback on a collaborative project. But it's through these experiences that our kids are building confidence, getting motivated, gaining new perspectives, and growing communities. And so I'd like us to stop for a minute and think about what's something that you've learned or that we've learned that could help all of us learn better together. And before the conference ends, would you tweet it out, or using some other form of social media, using these hashtags? Because the more opportunities we give ourselves and our students to do things like this, the more we really do see that together we learn better. Thank you.